those are sources so resources offline for quantum information processing. Okay, thanks a lot and uh, thank, thanks to the organizers for inviting me here. Um, I really love that this is a very um, diverse field of talks you, you have here from really more um, computer science oriented talks to really uh, more practical talks. And I will be giving a more practical talk, so this will be really about hardware. And I think hardware is, is important also here in, in, in that context of quantum information processing. So basically, I will um, back up on uh, things that Ian Wormsley pointed out uh, yesterday. Um, and um, this is also why I will be talking about uh, sources, sources of the light that is used for quantum information processing. Um, so let me first um, um, uh, point out uh, one, one challenge I, uh, we have here. Well, um, uh, you also saw now in, the, in this workshop that in quantum information processing we have various uh, physical systems and uh, um, various implementations of uh, gates, uh, of sources, of memories and so on that are excellent um, in various parameters. But it would be good to be able to really um, uh, combine uh, those components that you really want to combine and what you really um, 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 run into problems because you have some compatibility problems. I mean, these problems of compatibility we all know in everyday life. Um, so you have different components and you want to make them compatible. Um, and uh, one way, of course, is you can have some kind of uh, converter to, to make them compatible. But the other um, solution is that you um, make the individual components more flexible, which will help you. And this is um, what I want to look at. So if you, for example, have a look at a quantum repeater scenario, you have uh, some, photonic, um, uh, some photonic quantum states in there. You need some memories. And um, usually, of course, you, you also have some interference of the photonic components. So um, you, to, in order to reach efficient coupling of those physical systems, you have to make sure that um, you fulfill some stringent requirements in, in different degrees of freedom. So often, for example, um, this boils down to really match central wavelengths, so bandwidths, um, types of that. This is what Ian Wormsley pointed out yesterday. Um, and he really, um, um, for example, uh, showed how you really can care about that in a quantum memory scenario. Now, I really want to um, point out what you can do in uh, the quantum, uh, the, the, the sources of, of the quantum states of quantum. I picked out three topics that uh, yeah. fit in there. So first, I um, will talk about some novel sources of the uh, parametric down conversion, um, uh, single photons and also continuous variable um, squeeze and entangle states that are based on whispering Ehrenberg resonators um, that are uh, very versatile and um, we hope that can solve a lot of those problems of compatibility. Um, then I will look into uh, more complex modes of different degrees of freedom and uh, see what we can do there. And at the end I will really go really applied and talk about the quantum communication, namely quantum key distribution in free space. And also there you will find out that you can, um, uh, that you, that you can of course adapt your quantum states to environment and this is also what is important in that case. Now, um, if you want to generate non-classical light, there are different ways how to do that. Um, we often heard now that uh, one very efficient way to do that is parametric down conversion. So basically, um, you have a pump photon, you have a nonlinear material, um, a chi 2 nonlinear material, um, and then this pump photon really decays into signal in either photon. So you have some energy constraints from photons, and you also have some constraints from momentum. And this is uh, what we usually talk about when we talk about phase matching in those systems. Um, if you look at that, you have always um, pairs of photons generated here um, in the 
simple picture. So, um, of course, this is a nice source of photon pairs you can have. Um, if you put around the cavity, you can make the process much more efficient, and this is also what is done, for example, in cavity assisted spontaneous chromatic down conversion. Or if you go into a different regime, I mean, if, if you have a cavity, you also have a threshold, um, so you can also go to the regime of um, a, an optical chromatic oscillator, which can uh, generate squeezed states or entangled states. And basically, if you really look carefully at what, what is happening, even in a spontaneous uh, chromatic down conversion, you also have a continuous variable entangled states, and you also have what I was pointing out there yesterday. One important thing here to note is, of course, to be efficient, um, you um, have to have a good nonlinearity, a nonlinear material, and an efficient cavity that you, that you have around your system. And this is why um, um, we came up with the whispering array mode system. So whispering array modes um, are a, well, um, this is quite an old topic. So to say, um, one very nice example you find not so far away from here in, in London St Paul's Cathedral, you have this nice dome, and um, at the dome there's a gallery. Now, if you if you are standing at one side of the gallery and you're whispering next to the wall, you can really hear it um, on the other side of the wall. And this is of course because the sound waves are traveling around this gallery. And uh, so very efficiently, the acoustics is transferred from one side to the other side. Um, people started to, to really study that a bit more scientifically, though, of course, I mean, you, you can find similar system uh, uh, in very, very old examples. But a bit more scientifically, they started to um, study that uh, 100 years ago or so, and they really did this studying the acoustic waves, putting, putting um, um, on torches and light, light sources and looking how the acoustic waves uh, behave. Um, but then later, um, uh, people also looked um, into similar problems in um, electromagnetism. So they studied Maxwell's equations and uh, uh, of course there you can also have boundary conditions um, that resemble this problem and so you can also have some uh, solution of Maxwell equations um, that are whispering gallery modes, and so this is what we want to look into. So um, you can have whispering gallery modes um, also in optics, and um, often you can find them in some amorphous materials, for example, fused silica, like those nice uh, glass spheres. Here you have one such fe uh, sphere, um, which has a very um, a, um, smooth surface and uh, there exist whispering gallery modes and total internal reflection that go around um, this uh, smooth surface here in this, in this circle on the sphere. Now, to produce such, uh, um, such whispering gallery mode resonators, you basically just melt these amorphous materials and this gives you these nice surfaces. So you have this spheres, for example, if you melt the, the tip of a fiber, um, or you have those nice microchloroids in, from the Valhalla group, Caltech, um, where you have those whispering gary modes going around here in the circumference. Um, so you really use um, surface tension and reflow process to generate that. Now, if you want to look at uh, nonlinearities in there, you, are, um, you have to rely on third order nonlinearity because you have this used silica material where there's no second order nonlinearity normally. So it's, it's, it's rather weak. And um, there are some other processes so that people could not see squeezed light and non classical light really generated directly out of those systems. Um, so we went a different approach. Um, there's also crystalline materials uh, which you can shape into some whispering area resonator. Uh, for example, you can really take a nonlinear crystal like lithium niobate, which is very well known. Many groups are using that for doing chromatic down conversion for a long time. Um, and now the trick is really you can uh, just uh, put it on a diamond turning machine and really turn it into a shape of a, uh, of a disc, for 
for example, of disk resonator. And then you can really polish the surface using just a diamond powder, polishing powder basically, and you can polish it very well. So that you can really generate this green gamma resonators from crystalline materials. Um, some of those crystalline materials have very uh, low losses, so for example, calcium fluoride um, that is used in the lithography industry for UV lithography, so they, it's really optimized to have no losses. Yet. So you have very, very good cavities. Why? Because um, basically the Q factor of such cavities, so how long the, the, the energy of the light is stored in there, is basically governed by the loss inside the material because the total internal <coughs> once the surface is very smooth um, goes very goes very well. So um, how do you get light into those the spring going mode resonators? Because I mean it's total internal reflection, so it's it's a bit hard to, to get the light inside or outside. So you do this by a venescent coupling. So you go, for example, with a prism or a, with a fiber, you see a tapered fiber here, very near to this um, this Gary mode resonator, and then you have some evanescent field overlap inside the this Gary resonator, and by changing the distance of this fiber or the prism, you can couple in and out from this resonator. So why do we want to use it for the generation of squeezing or classical light? Well, um, if you really want to have efficient only processes, in a, a cavity, of course, you have the, the, the Q factor of the cavity, the quality factor that tells you um, how long really can you can store the energy in, in, the, in this cavity. And um, you want to care about the, the volume of your modes, the mode volume, which, which tells you something about the optical energy density. And the Q factors can be very high for listen nearby, for, for, for listen nearby, by crystal, crystalline disk resonators, so it's not of 10 to 8 for the, uh, the experts to compare. Um, and so you can have very efficient nonlinear processes. One, one thing one also has to point out is this, uh, that, that those resonators, they are monolithic. So you really have one disk uh, made from the material. So normally if you have a cavity, you can always have your mirrors that shake or other things you really have to control. Not so here. The, the nonlinear material is the resonator. So they have a very good stability. The other thing is, as, as I told you, with the evanescent coupling, you can change uh, your output coupling. So it's it's like taking a normal public mirror cavity and exchanging your mirrors. We can just do this by uh, changing the distance of our prism or our fiber that is coupling in there. So you can kind of in real time change your, your, your cavity parameters, which makes it very flexible. And the other very important thing is that total internal reflection works for all the wavelengths in the material uh, where the material is still transferable. So, um, unlike in a, in a cavity where you normally have some coated mirrors that are specialized for some wavelength region, you can really tune the whole setup throughout the whole transpar transparency range of your material. So this is what makes it really versatile, the source. Um, now, um, some years ago we really um, achieved uh, some, some face matching, some natural face matching in, in those configurations. So basically the trick is we can change the temperature of this whispering area mode resonator, which changes different uh, reflective indices of different polarization, which can help you to achieve the face matching conditions. Um, how does how does those um, modes and the resonators look like? Well, now this is this is a schematic of such a resonator. So you have this disc shape, um, and then you have those modes, those modes that, that, that live inside the resonator. And how can you describe those modes? Well, uh, you really have some quantization numbers of, of those modes. And basically, if you have a rather spherical resonator, this really resembles to the um, modes in a hydrogen atom. So it's basically the same mathematics. Um, you can also play around with the uh, mode um, spectrum a little bit by varying this shape here, making it a bit less spherical. Um, and by that, uh, by that method, 
uh, you can make the spectrum of the modes more dense or less dense and so on. So basically, if you also have a free spectral range in, in such a cavity, of course, this is the time that light takes to travel one, uh, once uh, in, in circumference. And this is really given by the size of this, this resonator system. How does it really look like? Well, that's it here. So here you see the resonator. It's uh, around 3 or 4 millimeter size. And then here you have the prism to couple it. So actually it's a diamond prism in our case because you uh, need to have a very high refractive index to couple the NSF layer to this one eye bay. Uh, but this can be done. Basically, light comes from here. You have total internal reflection here. Some light couples in there, goes around, some light couples out again. So this is this is a schematic setup. You have a laser, you couple in, light goes through. Um, then you have some nonlinear interaction, for example, parametric down conversion. Light comes out again. Um, now, if uh, we often study this in a non-degenerate uh, uh, way, that means the parametric down conversion uh, delivers signal and idle of different wavelengths, so we can just um, divide the different wavelengths by dispersion prism and then detect signal and idle and pump. <coughs> now, to achieve really this um, efficient phase matching conditions, you have to do two things. Uh, one thing is you measure the temperature of your resonator. You can do that. Just heat and cool it. And the other thing is you can also change, uh, you can put a bias voltage on top of the crystal. Because the lucinoibate has a pH electric effect, so it, it is used for electro-optic modulators. So you can change your refractive indices by a voltage, and that means you can really also play with the phase matching conditions by voltage. So this you can do very fast. Um, so if you look at the output, parametric gamma conversion, um, so basically we built an OPO, an optical parametric oscillator, and you find out something like that. If we look here, the output, that's the wavelength, 1000 nanometers, 1100 nanometers, and you have signal and idler over here and here. If you now um, tune, detune your pump frequency, you see that um, you have some small resonance line. That resonance line of your resonator, you really create your parametric down conversion signal. And because your quality factor cavity is so high, you have an optical chromatic oscillator with extremely low threshold. So your threshold is about 7 microvolts. So normally, those systems uh, that you usually use thresholds are what is the magnitude of high. So the question still was, can one really generate um, quantum states out of that system? Because there might be some processes that are competing, or some processes that produce noise also. Um, so first thing one can really look at is quantum correlations from signal and I like generated in those, um, in those systems. So you have pump, you have the OBO, you have signal and I like. It's correlated photons, and if you drive it above threshold, this correlation of photons really uh, generates quantum correlations in uh, tense beams of light. So the correlations in those beams of light are better than you could do ever modulating classically um, some, some various states. And this has been has been um, shown some long time ago in the 80s in France. So we had a look at that. So what you see here is also we scan the pump frequency, so we have some resonance, and that resonance with parametric down conversion. Then what you always look at, uh, you look at the sum and the difference of the signal and idler, and basically the difference, the difference of signal and idler should go below the short noise limit, which you know is the quantum. And this is what we see here. So the difference is below the short noise limit. That means the quantum correlations are better than what you can, could, it, could achieve with, with some classical modulators. So that's OK. Um, there's, there's one other thing that is less well known um, that was predicted already in the 80s theoretically. So if you have that a configuration above threshold and you have signal and island, they're quantum correlated. And you don't measure the correlations, but you only look at one beam, then you will find that this individual beam is already squeezed if you drive the system far off threshold. So far, people really couldn't achieve that to measure that directly because you have some competing processes there in bulk uh, systems. So, for example, you have relaxation oscillations in your 
and your crystals, a bit like in laser systems, um, that produce additional noise and you can't see that. So luckily we, we have such an extreme parameter <coughs> in, in our system that we can easily drive out those relaxation oscillations out of our, uh, from our measurement knowledge. So this is <coughs> what we could measure and we could really prove that those individual squeezing exists in those, in those um, um, single beam measurements. And they really match very nicely to the theory that was predicted by, by the French group in, in the 80s. Now, this is nice. We have um, uh, a nice source for um, um, a continuous variable squeeze in entangled states. Now, how about a tunable single photon source? That would be nice to have. Um, so, one way to do this very efficiently is using cavity assisted spontaneous chromatic down conversion. That's been tried some, some while ago, and there are also some very nice systems how to do that. Um, why do you want to do that? Well, I mean, if you normally have box systems um, to really select one wavelength and also a certain bandwidth, for example, to match atomic transitions, that can be a very narrow line in a range of megahertz, you can filter, for example. You can filter very much, but this means you lose efficiency. And you don't want to have that because you want to have a certain count rate. Um, um, to circumvent that, of course, you can build a cavity around your sp spontaneous um, chromatic down conversion process. And that means um, you really s kind of select only the good modes that you want to have um, right away. Um, one, and you can be very efficient with those systems. One drawback there is, of course, this cavity is specialized in a very, uh, on, on, on some wavelengths because you have to carry the mirrors. And stuff. Now, we, d we don't have that specialization on, on, on some wavelengths. I mean, we have this disk resonator, it works for all the wavelengths we can just couple in, and we can tune our wavelengths uh, with the help of uh, temperature and voltage and changing the phase nature. So this is what we try. Um, uh, we build the system, we have the disk resonator, we couple in, we um, again have signal and idler. Now the signal and idler, uh, we drive this with, with very low pump powers. That's really in the nanowatt regime. So, um, and what then really comes out is um, a nearly, nearly photon pairs. There's of course some chromatic down conversion, you always have also some contributions of higher photon numbers, but if you if you be careful and, and you pump not so hard, then it's, it's, it's nearly photon pairs. And uh, the first thing that you can show here, you look at the uh, <coughs> cross-correlation um, G2 function between signal and idler, this is what we did here, and it tells you something about um, the time scales in the system. So basically that's the bandwidth of your uh, photon pairs that's coming out. And you see here, the band, bandwidth here is in the, in the range of megahertz. That's really nice if you want to couple it to atomic systems, for example. Um, and we can change the bandwidth. We can continuously change the bandwidth by changing the coupling here, by uh, changing the distance of the prism to the, to the resonator. Um, so we measured here, change from about 7 megahertz to 30 megahertz. Um, if we take a different geometry and size of the resonators, we can easily go to 100 megahertz. If we want. Um, so one thing about efficiency, um, the efficiency of the source, if you want to say, okay, how many photon pairs do I get out per second, per pump power, per bandwidth? Um, this, is, this is very efficient, so it's, it's much more efficient than the um, best uh, cavity-assisted sources we found so far. Um, this is because also you have a, a very high Q system that works inside here and is triply resonant. That means it's resonant for all the wavelengths again. So also the pump is resonant. Um, then, if you you can also use it, of course, as a heralded single photon source. So we detect one photon here, and then we measure the G two function, um, um, the, 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 the autocorrelation function of the the other side, so signal and idler. If you do this, you get the nice dip here showing that you have a single single photon <laughs> character. And if we look at the quality of those single photons, so you basically look at um, um, the non-heralded <coughs> G2 autocorrelation function on one side, and you compare that to a 
to a thermal state that should be there for a perfect case. Then we found out we have about three effective modes without any filtering. We really tried hard not to filter at all at this source. So we put everything on free space APDs that we could get. And um, so you can even improve on that by um, um, changing the geometry of this displacement to drive it more in a single mode regime. <coughs> now, for tuning, I told you, okay, you can have temperature and, and ice voltage to, to, to tune your source. And um, what, we, what we saw here, um, you can change the temperature and then you find here um, signal and idler. Um, because you, by temperature you change the phase matching condition and that changes, of course, the, the, the wavelength of, of signal and idler that are coming out. You can find a you know, broad range, a very broad range, about 100 nanometers here. Now lately, we really showed much more than 500 nanometers in our lab that we could tune readily. Um, and uh, one goal, of course, would be to, to bridge alkali atom transitions and telecom wavelengths for optical fiber networks. And we are already pretty close to that. So, and there's no, no principal physical limit to, to do that. Uh, why, why you couldn't do that. Um, so, that would also deliver, of course, a very efficient single photon source of 1500 nanometers, which is not so easy to achieve otherwise. Uh, the other nice thing is you can really also look at uh, what happens when you change the voltage and you change your phase matching condition. And um, this surprisingly uh, worked uh, very well. So what you can do then, you can select some wavelength range, then do some fine tuning. So you can really, uh, here we showed some tuning around 150 megahertz. You can really tune next to an atomic transition, really continuously tune in the megahertz range. Um, so, um, what to, what to study with the source and next? I mean, one, one, the, the nonlinearities are so efficient there that you can really also have a look at cascading nonlinearities. So, second harmonic generation, then harmonic down conversion again, for example. Um, of course, one, uh, one interesting question is also to couple that to other quantum systems because it's very versatile. Coupling into atomic systems, coupling into energy centers, and so on. So couple them, of course, also. Um, by bringing them very near to this resonator and then have the MSM coupling. Um, <coughs> bridging alkali transitions in telecom wavelengths. Um, so this is, um, I don't see any reason why we, we, we couldn't do that and we are very near to that. Um, one very nice question is also um, whether you could combine optical mechanics and nonlinear non behavior and, and a quantum light generation in those systems. Because um, you can imagine, I mean, optomechanics in that system means um, basically the, the size or the, or the shape of this disk just vibrates, right? But then on the outer rim, this is where really the Swiss Brangeri modes lives. And um, this is also where this uh, nonlinear process and where the quantum states are, gen uh, um, are generated. So there would be a very strong interaction between those two systems. So, um, now I want to jump to the next topic where it's really more about um, um, different degrees of freedom. So, um, in continuous variable quantum optics there has been a lot done um, concerning the spatial uh, degree of freedom, so spatial multi-mode systems which could, for example, um, help you to increase the, the capacity of your quantum channels a multi-mode system. Also, it has been studied a lot of polarization states, of course, um, the squeezing polarizations for example. Now, our goal was to combine those two deg degrees of freedoms and really have more complex vectorial modes. And the easiest example you can have, have in, in that case is um, those vectorial modes that are smoothly polarized or radially polarized. So this is really modes of the light field that have a very complex polarization pattern. So already in, uh, in, in the classical field there's some, some nice applications for that. For example, with that mode you can focus much better than you could do ever with the Gaussian linear polarized. Um, 
So, if you now look at that um, quantum optics, you can see, okay, um, those special modes, they are actually, can be described as a superposition um, of some other basis modes. So basically, basically the smoothly or, or radially polarized modes are superpositions of um, TM01 and 10 modes with different polarizations. And one uh, intriguing thing is that you really can't um, separate polarization and spatial degrees of freedom already in the classical world. So they're really, they're really connected. And this very fact uh, leads to, to some interesting things if you now want, for example, squeeze such a mode. So you take such a complex mode, you basically apply a squeezing operator, so you change the, the, the statistics of the quantum state, and then you find out that if you look at it in your basis modes, um, you not only have squeezing in the individual basis modes, but you also, in addition, have entanglement. So that kind of comes for free. It's a very complex structure. And this, then in turn, can lead to what we call continuous variable hybrid entanglement. So, hybrid entanglement is really entanglement between two different degrees of freedom. So, you have two different degrees of freedom and you have entanglement between them. Um, so, in our case, we can generate entanglement between the spatial and the polarization degrees of freedom for those continuous variables. So, how do you do, you do that? You take such a squeezed state. You put in a mode splitter, this can be as easy as a, uh, a polarizing beam splitter that um, puts you into those basis modes and then you can, <coughs> um, you can um, manipulate those basis modes basically just putting in a kind, kind of local oscillator if you want so and then you can end up with a state that is either entangled polarization, polarization or spatial and spatial modes, or polarization and spatial modes. So really a hybrid case. Here. So you can uh, take whatever best suits in your applications. Um, can we really realize such a state? And there's uh, several ways how to do that. Uh, one way is to take a normal <coughs> squeezed state, Gaussian beam, take a converter there, some liquid crystal converters you really can buy. Uh, that, change, that change the state of the light. Um, there's one problem, there's losses, but we still tried that, that's, that's pretty okay. The other way is to really generate it in a nonlinear medium that really is specialized on this, those kind of modes. And you can su find such a nonlinear medium um, that guides those modes and has an uh, efficient nonlinearity if you take a photonic crystal fiber. So this brings me to the other um, or some, some other effects uh, um, um, how, to, how to generate non-classical states of squeeze light and that's of course using the, the chi 3 nonlinearity. Uh, and one easy way how to explain it, um, how to, to squeeze for example a, a coherent state inside an optical fiber of the optical carry effect is you take the phase space here you have a coherent state now the optical carry effect, what does it do? It um, changes the refractive index dependent on, on, on the intensity. So, um, change of refractive index means um, uh, a change of phase when your light travels because it needs a bit longer. It goes, it goes uh, a bit um, uh, with, with less path length through the material. So, um, now um, intensity. Um, also is connected with amplitude, so that means in phase space, these points in phase space have less phase shift, these points have more, are associated with more intensity, so they um, encounter more phase shift. So you um, change this circular um, distribution of the coherent state. That's basically what's happening. And now the only thing is you need a very special fiber that is able to guide those very complex modes. Uh, and they're luckily, uh, Philip Russell is also in, in Erlangen, uh, who invented those photonic crystal fibers. And you can find a photonic crystal fiber that really guides those strange modes. Basically, you have a microstructuring in those fiber, and you have a very, very tiny hole inside the core that lights the guide, the, uh, that guides the light field. And this tiny, this tiny hole 
um, changes the boundary conditions such that the eigenmodes that are really traveling inside this fiber are those vectorial modes of the light field. And then, if you, if you put up such a system, you can show that you can really have squeezing in such a complex mode, and you can really also show quantum correlations in such, in such modes. So basically, um, you saw that uh, this, this already this complex class, classical um, behavior and this inseparability of polarization in spatial modes leads to some very complex behavior in continuous variable um, uh, quantum optics. Um, now this can enable you to, to uh, measure entanglement at different degrees of freedom if in some protocol you really have to rely on one or the other different uh, uh, degrees of freedom in some setting. Uh, we also, right now, uh, study this uh, towards continuous variable cluster state generation. Um, this kind of complex structure that can help you to rather easily um, generate cluster states, continuous variable cluster states for computer. Now, at the end of the, of the talk, I really want to go into something more applied, and that means really um, going into the direction of a Okay. Um, quantum communication protocol and that one that is really most important in some practical aspects right now probably is quantum key distribution. Um, and there we want to really focus on free space quantum uh, communication. So basically the problem here is you want to propagate a quantum state um, to a free space channel there can be all sorts of strange effects, turbulences, space shifts, um, losses uh, that will disturb your quantum state. This is, of course, very detrimental effects, uh, but you have to cope with them. And um, there has been some nice experiments in the discrete variable regime, of course, um, Vienna groups and other groups that, that have very, very long distances, but somehow nobody really dared to do that in the continuous variable regime. And um, it will become a bit clear later why, probably why this is so. Now, uh, quant uh, quantum key distribution with, con with continuous variables um, means basically that you take coherent states and do homodyne measurements on them. This is really what, what also industry does in basic fiber communication uh, channels. Um, the, the only requirement that you really have in quantum key distribution is that you need non orthogonal quantum states. So coherent states are really fine once they really overlap very much in phase space. So they have to be non orthogonal. And then what you can do there, and uh, that you really measure to do just homodyne measurement in that phase space and take this homodyne data as the data for your quantum key distribution. What is the difference between discrete variables and continuous variables there? Well, um, basically, in principle, you can, they're, 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 they're both equally well suited. Um, differences are more rather te technical. Um, so, in continuous variables, you use uh, quadrature variables, so you need local oscillators, or you take polarization where the kind of local oscillator is included. Um, so, you have homodyne detections uh, with um, rather high speed, so you're not limited to, to some problems that you have with APDs, though APDs also get uh, rather, rather fast uh, these days. Um, one bit nice thing is that you, re uh, you really don't have to care about stray light. So you don't have to filter anything um, because your local oscillator acts really as a radio frequency filter in your system. You don't care about the filters from the sun. Um, but of course there's one Con, we don't have intrinsic post selection for single photons. If a photon is lost, you don't measure. Here we always measure. So if we have loss, it, degrade, it, it degrades our quantum states. And this is, of course, something you have to take into account. So if you want to go through some turbulent atmosphere, you better encode in polarization in that system. Um, and we really do this. I and mean, you have the Congaree sphere you can see here. And then we have. Um, many photons in our state, <coughs> so we have a mean value that points to some state polarization here, and then we have our quantum phase space that is around this mean value, so kind of if you look at the top of the concrete sphere, 
and locally you can treat this like a flat face space, really like a quadrilateral face space. Now the good thing here is that um, in polarization um, we, we also have shown some some roof kind of roof experiment um, that uh, polarization is very immune to turbulences because in that configuration your reference your local oscillator is really a complementary quantum state and both really see the same turbulence, the same phase shifts, and so on. So that means you, you, you really don't care about all those turbulence problems. Um, and the atmosphere is not birefringent, at least not if you don't go through some high ice clouds or something like that. Um, that means polarization doesn't get changed. Um, and one good thing, of course, there is that the local oscillator really selects the mode that you want to have and you don't really care about whether the sun is also pointing in your detector or not. So lately we really set up a real point-to-point -point link uh, from our institute to um, the, the university computer center. So this is what it looks like if you look directly into the beam, with, which of course you shouldn't do with your eye, but this is uh, uh, taken with the camera. Um, and uh, what we were interested in is, I mean, okay, coherent states, we could show that that works pretty nice. Um, can also more complex states like squeeze states survive that situation? And so we built a very portable uh, uh, squeezer here. You can really put it on the roof of our inst institute and have a telescope in there, um, send the, the beams to the, to the other building. And uh, we were really surprised how uh, nicely we could really transmit those speed states. So we really were only limited by the um, optical transmission loss that we had in that system. Okay, with that I uh, want to conclude. So um, I want to show that to you that those crystalline Vespering array resonators really um, provide some, some really versatile source of quantum states of light that um, could be able to really bridge all those compatibility problems that you often have in quantum information processing. Then, as another example, uh, those complex vectorial modes, they also offer the possibility to bridge different degrees of freedom. And um, the last message kind of I had was that you really should adapt also your quantum states to the environment. For example, here in the uh, free space communication with continuous variables, you better take those polarization encoding because technically it really can help you a lot. Um, so this is this is my group. I want to thank. So basically, um, this Mr. Gary mode uh, was uh, done mostly by Joseph Bust and Dimitri Stakalov from from JPL here and Michael Perch. Uh, then there was uh, the work um, uh, of those vectorial modes it was performed by Christian Gabriel and um, um, Anne Marie. Um, um, she's in Oxford now here. So and in the Free space setup, um, Bettina Heim and uh, Christian Pointing uh, um, contributed most to that experiment. With that, I want to thank all the members of the group and also thank you for listening.
but otherwise, I mean, this is um, the material is not too bad to work with, so you could really also make them really small. So I guess it's uh, 100 micron or something like that. Maybe could be possible. So we're thinking about some solutions. We are also thinking about some other materials. Uh, where potentially one could also build some sources that go into the UV. That of course would be interesting for uh, um, uh, iron trap situations, right? Would have some, some for those when you mentioned this uh, squeezing in individual beams, is the intuition correct to think that it's simply the taking away pairs from the pump? And then the pump becomes kind of sub Poissonian, and then it makes below Poissonian noise in each beam. When you said squeezing of each of those beams, was it the number squeezing that you observed? That's, yeah, absolutely. Right. So, so. so then uh, I guess what I'm saying is probably correct, in which case you could also look for the squeezing in the pump, I suppose. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, um, um, we have a triply resonant system here, so that should be very efficient. And so one thing, of course, one could look at is, is in the direction of the Nussen Zweig group and so on, really look at all the features mm -hmm. in here, you're absolutely right there. Yeah. And another question, you mentioned uh, cavity-assisted spontaneous parametric down conversion. In what way it's different from just optical parametric amplifier below threshold? Oh yeah, um, in, in, in principle it's the same setup, only that we really go very much below threshold. So, uh -huh. so we, we really want to, 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 to be away from the threshold because we really want to, don't want to have um, those two photon components, three photon components. In there. So really right, so this is just the... It's, it's, it's an EPR state. That, that is, right, that and then you on. use it for single photon generation. Absolutely. Have something to talk. <laughs> okay, that's fine.